So you can see it now? Yep. Okay, perfect. So, oops, sorry. Here you see the ball going to Juliet here. And she hits a backhand that gets intercepted and the opposition play. Luckily, our counter control is pretty good and we manage to stop the attack. My question to you is, what is your reaction if she does that in your team? I think she showed good com confidence because the girl wasn't coming at her. The girl kept backing away. So she was carrying it and holding on to it. For the right moment and then she made the pass did she make the pass at the right time i have to double watch it to make that decision okay, cool. yeah i think that maybe the problem is before not the backhand itself but maybe to which position she got because of not having good pre-scanning she got in a corner and yeah it's hard to get out of there i don't think the problem is the backhand for being the technique itself but which position she was in i think that when she started running with the ball she was getting herself around all, all players from their team and then it's really hard to get out of there. So if we stop the, if we stop the video here, um, if she hits a backhand here, is that the right option? What do you think, guys? I think she has a good chance here. Yeah, maybe to the right forward, I see a really clear path. If she technically can do it, I don't know her that much, but I think it's a good idea, yeah? Awesome. Yeah, because the off position are all going the other way, aren't they? So she's in a good position to manipulate them. The gap is there as well for her to hit it through to the, the right wing. Yeah, yeah so mm. the, gap, the, the gap is really there. So the gap is there. The opposition are all running over in this direction. The help side is struggling to get back. So if you look, this is the moment she gets her head up to try to look for the pass. We then move it on a little bit. So she's looked up for the pass. She keeps on carrying. And then she strikes, and this is where um, Javier makes the great point that the problem is that she comes into the corner and she takes so long to hit that pass. And if you remember all the way back to what we spoke about in the beginning, where I showed you different techniques and you told me what I was about to do just by the shape of my body, if you look at, if you look at what she's doing, she's already switched her grip. She puts her hand up. She changes the stick position. In this position, everyone knows what she's about to do. So what happens to these two players in here? They mark in front. They mark in front. They get ready to intercept. All of those great points that you guys are making. So they're ready to block. For me, this is exactly, um, this is exactly um, what you guys are saying. That because they can see that she's about to hit that backhand, they all jump in and they get ready to intercept. So if we look at that and we go to this, this next video. So if I play that again, What's now the difference between the first one and the second one? I think the first difference is she's running with her forehand first. So she's keeping the center of the pitch now. And at the last moment, she just changed to backhand. So it's more a surprise. Yeah, exactly. So for me, it's more of a surprise. She kept the options open. And the backhand was something that they didn't see coming. So the transition between her having the ball on her forehand and her delivering a backhand was much quicker. If we also look at the position of where she was, so compared to the compared to the other girl, where is she now compared to the other girl? Yeah, ten meters inside. She's ten meters inside. She's a lot closer towards the girl that is probably going to intercept. So all of these things also um, have a big impact on the success of the skill. Now, why do I why do I talk to you about that? I talk to you about that because for me, we go through. Um, opportunity or threat that's the first thing we always look at um so for us there was an opportunity to play that pass 
Now, the opportunity for me is something that we can do to hurt the opposition. And a threat is something that um, if we don't get better at this, then the opposition will hurt us. Um, so the opportunity for me was we had the chance to reach a high player from the centre-back position when the press springs. In terms of techniques, um, we're looking at a backhand hit on the move over long distance. Do we teach that to an individual or do we teach that to a team or a group? For me, this thing is something that we teach to our centre-backs because we want a range of distribution from the back. So that's my thought process when I'm going through what it is I'm going to be teaching people um, each, each, uh, each skill. What do we have to think about? Um, we're looking at, okay, for me, we've got the first thing is awareness. Then we have preparation and then we have execution. So we've already heard from some of you, is this a decision-making problem or is it an execution one? So this is exactly what that's talking about. First, we have to look at the aware, then we look at prepare, and then finally we have the actual execution of the skill. So if I throw it out to you guys and you turn on your mics, what would aware look like? What do we need to be aware of when we're, when we're preparing to hit this backhand? The movement of the opposition. Great point, Graham. Uh, the movement of the opposition. Uh, what do you mean by that? Just there, where, where they're tracking, so where the gap's going to open up. Exactly. So where are the gaps? What's the opportunity? Anything else? So where you are on the field, what's around us and who? Some really cool points. Anyone else got some things to add? Yeah, even maybe the moment of the game. If you're winning, if you're losing, it's not going to be the same decision for sure. How much risk you are going to take. Exactly. So that's really cool as well. You have to be aware of the situation. So it's not just... Um, the context of what's happening on the field. It's also the context of what's happening in the game. Um, are you ahead? Are you behind? Um, are you, is it the last two minutes? What's, what's really the situation right here? Um, I would also put in this um, aware of um, where you are in a program. So is this something that we're just introducing, which means I'm expecting her to be, um, I'm expecting this to not be so successful? Is this somewhere that we've been practicing a little bit or is this something that we're actually really good at? So she needs to know where she is in her own development um, as well as all of the other things. If we look at prepare, what can she do in the preparation phase of the skill delivery? The position of the ball, how she's carrying it, already preparing what's going to come next. Also to fake a bit because the second example was good because she was, she maybe she knew she wanted to do a backhand, but she was first carrying with the forehand and just at that last moment she turned and did it. Exactly. So the position of the ball, I think is really important. Um, so Andy said that as well, ball position with regards to your own body. Um, I think as well, there are, there are things like um, your grip change. So your grip with a forehand, and your grip with the back end are two completely different grips. And the switch from one to the other also comes in a preparation um, phase. Um, disguise intention, awesome. Um, so all of these things are really important. And then the execution, that's what we spoke about earlier in terms of what are the actual essentials that we need in order for this skill to be um, delivered. So if I just move this on really quickly, these are some of the things that might be under each of them. So um, the cues, the options, and the spaces that are available. Um, now you can put that down to pre-scanning. Um, the preparation is everything we spoke about. So your position um, with the ball, um, where your body is positioning. Um, are you going up and down or do you have a steady body position? Um, what's happening with your grip? Are you actually making the connection with the play on that's going to be receiving the pass? And in the execution, like I said, it's all of the things that we've spoken about previously. Now, what I wanted to do is just talk about this. So I hear this a lot from coaches. We practiced this on Thursday. It's Saturday already. Why can't we do it yet? Um, had, like put in the chat if you've ever heard somebody say that or if you've said it yourself. Maybe not Thursday and Saturday, but something similar. Come on, guys, we practiced this.
Okay, so a fair few of you have heard this before. So then we start talking about, okay, well, if we consistently hear people say that, come on guys, we practice this, you should be able to do this by now. Then my idea is that we start looking at, okay, well, what is it we should be expecting of the players and how can we start to make sure that we're a little bit more streamlined in that? So um, I have three phases that we go through with the players. The first one is exploration. The second one is fine tuning. And the third one is performance. Now, if I go back to the point that Sharon made earlier um, in the chat, which was um, me telling the players to dribble, 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 and if you lose it, it's okay. Um, she said that makes her cringe. Uh, Sharon, do you just want to talk about that just really briefly? Hi, uh, yeah. Um, so the reason it makes me cringe a little bit is obviously um, some, some of the children are obviously like to take on the challenge of dribbling and showing off the skills that they've always spent time away from the pitch practicing but then it has a massive knock-on effect to the other children around them who obviously haven't practiced as much admire what the other child is doing but feel overwhelmed and don't feel that they can take part in that so in the end they end up sitting back but then get frustrated so they they then want to be involved in that game and are begging for the ball to be able to practice that but then it kind of, this child who's obviously quite talented will go on and gain more confidence and becomes a ball hogger. So I, I cringe a little bit because it's trying to get that fine balance to have confidence on the ball, but at the same time, involve their teammates, if that makes sense. Um, it does make sense. Is there anybody that wants to um, give their views on what Sharon's just said? Hi, this is Ying. Uh, I have players like that as well at primary school level, under 12. Um, well, it's good that my players are confident, they want to carry the ball, but sometimes I try to help them to see uh, at, at certain situations it's a team game, or uh, we talk about if he can't beat like five, six players at one go, he could look up and there's a better option to pass, but I give him the decision making. I let him decide that there are other ways that he can do it. I, does not, I do not stop him. And I, th I think that that's a really important point, Ying, um, that it's about giving an awareness of what's happening, but not stopping them. And I completely get what you're saying, Sharon. And um, for me, it's, it, as somebody who was the ball carrier, and I was somebody who wanted to do everything on my own in the beginning, um, I, even I cringe sometimes when you have one player that just dominates the whole game. That's why for me, it's super important that we do this technical training with everybody and we send them away and they start to um, improve their own proficiencies in the technical skills. So they understand how to manipulate the ball. They understand that they can do it as well because if they stop learning and we just only do the team training stuff, which is pass, 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 um, then essentially what we're saying to this kid that's got this talent is, okay, yes, you've got talent, but we don't want to see it. Um, we just want to see you passing the ball. Now, if you give that message to a, a talented kid uh, or a skillful kid right at the beginning, then what they get is one, resentment against the way that we want to play. And two, they start to learn that actually they need to stop practicing the elimination stuff and they need to um, improve on their passing stuff because that's how they're going to be able to conform with their group. Um, for me, I, what I do is right at the beginning of a program, and we're talking about the very, very young juniors, we just get them doing their dribbling and um, ball manipulation stuff. Because when they're like uh, under sevens, under eights, under nines, under tens, like we, we can teach them, yes, we teach them passing as well, but we teach them all about how to manipulate the ball and ball carry because at that age, we can get them really comfortable with the ball. It's only three aside or something like that. So they don't have all of these massive passing options anyway. So it's all about how they can start to be aware of what they can do. Then we start talking about, okay, me against somebody else. Then we talk about me and my friend against somebody else. Then we talk about me and my friend against somebody else and somebody else. Um, then we talk about a 3v3 situation. And then from there, we start building up into seven aside, 11 side, and from there. Um, the, reason I, the reason I go through that is because 
I think, as you can see here, the exploration phase is all about the players just trying things. And if we start talking about we have to share the ball and you can't dribble, then we're already from a very young age going into something that I think is uh, around performance, uh, where the players feel like they have to do what they need to do to win the game. And I think putting the players in a performance environment from too young um, just is not good for their long-term development. Anybody want to make a point on that? Hi, Darren. Maybe about the, when you said the carrying the ball, I also prefer everybody knowing how to carry and to be elimination, the, to know how to eliminate, but maybe just give a different aspect to the person that is carrying the ball, the ball the most. When he makes a pass, then maybe reward him with some positive comment. Like, if he's eliminating everything and you know that he can do it with his eyes closed, you don't give him a, a feedback. And if he passes a really nice pass, you give him a super nice, like, moi pass or, or ni nicely done. So he sees the difference between that it's also rewarded if he does a pass, but it's also rewarded if he eliminates, but it's a different value to the team. Yeah, awesome. And so I'm just going to throw up a new... Just to be very clear, I'm not talking about every team I've ever coached all the way through to um, senior internationals. We tell them uh, you, don't, you don't pass the ball. What, we, what I'm talking about is just, it's just a, a small phase right at the beginning where they're, introduced, they're being introduced to hockey. I want them, before I start talking about having to win games and pass a ball, we start talking about how to manipulate it. So this isn't something that I'm talking about uh, with an under-16 team and you've got a kid that wants to start carrying the ball all over the place. We're talking about the real youngsters where we're introducing the game. So we have um, so maybe under-10 that's first starting to play hockey. Um, we have the season broken up into pieces. So this first piece might be me and ball which is all about them, where I don't expect them to pass the ball. I just want them to start carrying the ball. Then we start, as I said, talking about me against somebody else. That will be introduced into this phase. Then it's me and, me and friend. And from this part, we already start talking about um, the need to start having the ability to pass. So within that, we talk about, okay, if I look like this, then, and I'm looking for a pass, if the defender starts to intercept, then you go for a carry. If the defender comes to block you, then you give the pass. So all of that stuff is wo woven into our program anyway. It's really just a small block. So I understand some of your concerns, but it's really, uh, it's really not a five-year thing where we just encourage the kids to go on a dribble fest. Um, of course, it's not that. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, awesome. No worries, Sharon. So if I jump back into this, we've got the exploration, fine tuning and performance. The whole idea is, um, if I just go through, we talk about the opportunities for them to play and the success that we expect from them. So in exploration phase, actually what we're saying is we give them some good opportunities just to explore, but I'm not expecting them to be any good at what they're doing. We expect lots of failure. Um, so if you think about hitting a backhand pass, for example, what we might do is throw them 100 balls in the circle and we say, okay, yes, right now you can't hit a backhand, but we just want you to hit every single ball into the goal that's in the circle with a backhand only. And within that, we start talking about, okay, um, how did that feel? Okay, that one was really cool. What went well? Oh, that one wasn't so good. What happened? And through that kind of exploration phase, we start to get the players a little bit um, just understanding what it is that they're doing with their technique that allows them to be a little bit more successful. Um, once we go from there, we get into fine tuning. So fine tuning for me is the part that most hockey teams do in their training, which is we know what works, we know what doesn't work, and now we're going to do more of what works and less of what doesn't work. So if we go back again to what Sharon was talking about earlier, this fine tuning phase is about us saying, okay, We've been through that phase where we know the basics of passing, we know the basics of eliminating, we know what works and when we should make the pass, we know what doesn't work and when we should make the carry. So let's now start being a little bit more um, accountable for that. So we give them a lot of opportunity and training in this period. 
but we expect the success to be better because we've explicitly spoken about what works and what doesn't work. Does that make sense, guys? If you uh, just let me know. Yeah. Perfect, cool. So um, once we've gone through the fine tuning, it's then into performance. In performance, we don't give them many opportunities, but we expect their success rate to be a lot higher. So what I mean is we might give them um, 10 balls to have a shot at, but only one of those will be a random hit on their back end. Do they have the ability to recognize um, the opportunity? Do they recognize the need to hit the back end? And can they recall all of the points that they need in order to execute correctly? Um, and of course, all of these, all of these principles and um, exploration, fine tuning performance, all of this is done in unopposed work. It's done in small unit play. It's done in small sided games, but it's also done in macro games as well. So it's, we've really got all of these different session types running throughout. So we can start to challenge the players in different ways and really make sure that they are, um, it's really inside of them. And it's not something that we can just uh, call upon in technical um, unopposed training. We then get onto this piece, which for me is an interesting one. So we look at consequences. How many of you use consequences in your, in your coaching at the moment? Anybody, nobody? Yeah, for example, if we have two teams, a team that loses has to collect the balls or something like this, maybe. Yeah, losers have to collect the balls. Uh, depends on the age of group to understand. Uh, nice point, Ed. Ed, what, what do you mean by that? In some of the groups, you've got younger kids that uh, you know, they don't quite understand what, you know, when you say what the consequences are, you know, especially when you've got... And like in my case, it's a regional team. You might have a nine-year-old, nine but you've also got a 13-year-old in the same team, you know, and that they're understanding of what they do and what the outcome is going to be, it's got to be very simple for the younger ones. Makes complete sense. So when I look at consequences, um, and Chris has said it, it stifles exploration. Um, for me, I completely believe that. So if we look at, if we look at a training session here where um, I'm doing, uh, if I'm doing a training session, uh, this session might be 10 minutes long. The first two minutes could be the player just um, hitting some backhand or it might be the player needs to make a pass, um, a pass through a gate or something like that. Just keep it very simple. Can the player make a pass through the gate? Um, exploration, they get to play around with it. Um, that's two minutes. Then we get into fine tuning. In the fine tuning, um, they have uh, four minutes to just play around with uh, doing a bit, uh, maybe six minutes just to play around with um, really practicing the skill based on the techniques that we've been speaking about. In there, we have limited consequences, but a little bit more. Now the consequences in fine tuning could be um, not you need to go for a run, but could be, ah, you missed. Okay, you need to be a little bit more accountable. What do you need to do? So it's not a punishment. It's more, okay, we're now starting to hold them accountable and they can start to see, ah, you didn't do what we were speaking about. Now, just my tone of voice could act as a consequence for them for them to realize, hold up, I'm not focusing on what we, what we agreed that we were going to do. Then we go into the last two minutes, which is performance. And in the performance, it could be them against them. So again, it doesn't need to be um, them against a nine-year-old against a 13-year-old in a training session. It could just be the first time I deliver versus the second time I deliver. Am I able to beat my own score? Now, just the fact that they're trying to compete against a score just them losing is a consequence of them not delivering what they expected to deliver. So what I'm trying to say is it doesn't always have to be a running forfeit. It doesn't always have to be a physical forfeit. Sometimes just having competition means that the players um, have that kind of um, consequence because just by not delivering what they was expecting to do, it means they weren't able to win the game. Uh, da, 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 da. 
uh, exactly as Jared said, consequences are more suited to the fine tuning performance phase. Uh, in, which, in which phase would you expect to have the highest coach feedback? Now for me, the feedback comes throughout, all the way through. Um, our job as coaches is to constantly um, but feedback looks completely different in each phase, Rebecca. Um, as I said, in exploration, for me, that's all around, okay, how did that feel? Oh, that was really cool. What happened? How did you do that? Oh my God, show me that again. That was incredible. Oh, that didn't look so good. What happened there? Ah, that didn't sound so nice. What happened? Um, all of those kind of open questions that are around the sensory side of the game means that the players are starting to be encouraged to understand what's happening. In the fine tuning, it's very much around, okay guys, what, from, that, from that last bit that we did, what worked, what didn't work? Tell me more, how does that link to this? Uh, so we're asking a lot more direct questions. Then in performance, it's, we agreed this, you didn't do it and it didn't work. I need to hold you accountable for this. So the three phases are completely different, um, but we're still engaged in each of them. Um, now, for me, the important part is that we're consistent in the way that we use our language, the way that we set up the environment, and what we're telling the players we are there to expect from them. So, as an example, if we're in exploration phase where I'm expecting lots of failure, then the moment I start saying, ah, you should have passed, means the players aren't actually feeling like they've got that freedom to make the failure which means they stop exploring and they just go back to doing what they, what they already know. Um, so it's really, really important that we're consistent in our language and the environment that we create dependent on which phase that we're in. Any comments on that before we move on? Because I'm just about to show you how that might look on a bigger picture. Awesome, thank you, Cassie. Glad you like it. Um, so this is just a small example of how that might look across a season. So as you can see, the season chunks into exploration, fine tuning and performance. So at the top, you can see exploration, fine tuning and performance. Um, the reason I say that is um, the first half of the season is just about us getting to know each other, getting to know the way that we play, getting to know our principles. So we will try lots of stuff, players in different positions, We'll try different formations. We'll try different principles. We will just play around with stuff and really explore. And it will all be based on something. So it's not completely open. So it's all based on something, but we do leave the players a chance to kind of just uh, create some stuff and see what happens. Um, then we get into fine tuning, which is, okay guys, we spoke in the first half of the season around just trying stuff. We've learned this from that first half. So this is what we're going to uh, do because we know it works. And this is what we're going to stop doing because we know it doesn't work. So the players get a, then a second half of the season where they get to a chance to really um, practice that and fine tune exactly what our game is, knowing that by the time we get to playoffs, that's where we need to perform. So in playoffs, there's no new theory, no new tactics, no new principles. Everything is what we've previously delivered but now we're expecting them to put it into practice and to um, make the right decisions at the right time. Now, just because we've got the big blocks at the top, we also, it doesn't mean we don't have the ability to kind of still learn new things. So as you can see in these blocks here, you've got um, exploration, fine tuning and performance. Then within each week you have exploration, fine tuning and performance, because here we might be in a performance phase of this exploration block. So we're looking to be a little bit better at what we're doing in the exploration stuff. It's not just a free for all where you can just do whatever you want. And then here you can see the sessions in the week where you have, a, for example, a Tuesday session is fine tuning, a Wednesday session, sorry, a Tuesday session is exploration, a Wednesday session is fine tuning, and a Friday session is performance because that's us getting ready for a Sunday game. Uh, what would you do in the performance phase for, say, 12-year-olds? Great question, Mindy. Um, so a performance phase for a 12-year-old is relative to their age. So when I say performance, I don't mean it looks like a senior international game. What I mean is it looks uh, where we want them to be 
for that phase or that phase in their in their uh, development. So, for example, just like I said with the under tens, uh, we start by saying it's all about ball carry. Then we go into me and a friend against somebody else. Um, the performance would be based on that phase that they're in. If they're in um, a phase where actually we're looking at the only thing we want them to do defensively is to stand between the person that has the ball and the goal, then do they have the ability to recognize who has the ball and stand between the person and the goal? That's the only thing that matters. Their ability to do their 1v1 defense, maybe that's not essential at that phase, but they need to be able to perform on the thing that we were, we were focusing on that moment. Does that make sense, Mindy? Awesome. Um, so that's just an overview of exploration, fine tuning performance, because I want you to see how we might start to be able to put in uh, bits of technical training. Now, of course, this isn't, this is just an example model of a season. This isn't exactly how a season goes. Things are not normally so uh, structured and um, yeah, laboratory like. Um, we all know that you make a plan and you go to your first session and the whole plan needs to be ripped up. So of course you need the ability to improvise and everything else. But this is just to show you a small model of what it could look like over a season. Um, then we get into um, this matrix over here, which is around um, session design. So this is something that I took from um, Danny Newcomb over at Oxford Brooks. Um, he looked at um, the different types of training sessions and what their emphasis might be. So on the left, you have technical training. On the right, you have tactical training. And then you've got the number of players that are uh, coexisting in the game. Um, so already, hopefully you can see that even though this is a technical training um, workshop, I'm still speaking about all of the things that you've heard last week from Jack, or sorry, two weeks ago from Jack, maybe. And uh, I can't remember who it was last week. So I still think that small sided games are a big part of what we should be delivering. But I also think that we need to use the whole range of session design so that we allow the players to have the right environment for where they need to be right now. So here I've said that unopposed practice um, could go, could help with our technical training, but I also think <coughs> that you used very little. Unopposed training could also help our understanding of tactical side of the game. So just doing a small uh, two minute walkthrough of our press could allow players to understand, okay, this is, this is the spacing that we might have between each of us and this is what we're trying to achieve then we might go into some small sided game or a macro game to put that into practice. But I still think that that unopposed um, action allows us just to isolate it. And so players are really aware of exactly what's expected of them. Um, so here you can see that unopposed practices, um, one or two players per side, small unit play is two to four players per side and so on. What I've got here is that I don't care what session you have, we have a responsibility to challenge every single player. Now, my question to you is how do we do that? How do we challenge individuals, even if we're doing a macro game or a small sided game? And I expect there to be a thousand answers because you've had two weeks of training on this. Let's go guys, open up your mics, it's too quiet. For example, to make them think, I think it's one big challenge. Try to, whatever training you're doing, make them have decision making, try to understand why they do what they're doing. This is, yeah, the first mental challenge I think we should try to, to do. Exactly. So Javier is talking about um, just why, you, why did you make the action? So having that accountability in the training means that you can have those individual conversations within a session. What else can we do? Hey, Darren, Jack. Um, I think the first one is a coach has got to value the individual within the team. If we're always team focused, we, we miss out on developing that individual. I, th I think that is a really, um, that's a really key one. And linking to what Edward's just put in the chat, 
um, setting certain players particular tasks or a skill to do in a game is really important. So that individual focus within the team means that players get better, which means they're suddenly more able to deliver what we're talking about. Um, da -da -da. Awesome, thank you, Millie. Can you make the session challenging itself with a lot to think of? Perfect. Um, so I have a basic um, philosophy that says, um, the more movements you have available, the more, um, the more solutions you have available to any challenge that you face. So if I only know how, for example, in terms of skill, the, if the only thing I know how to do is to put my stick over the ball and drag from left to right, then no matter what challenge I face, that will be my solution. But if I know how to manipulate the ball in a whole load of different ways, it means that when I face a challenge, I've got more solutions available to me to be able to overcome that challenge. And it's exactly the same if we're talking about tactically, that if we know we want to play our game, but the players only have the ability to make small passes, it means we never have the ability to play long passes in our tactical game, which means the solutions we have are really limited. So the ability to challenge the players individually in these team sessions and expect them and ask them and require of them to develop their own technical skills means that suddenly we have so many more possibilities there to allow us to find different solutions to whatever challenge you give the team within the small-sided games and within the macro games as well. Does that make sense as a concept and as a principle? Yeah, Darren, yeah. actually, I, I, sorry, I, I thought I, we can connect that to what you were saying when we were speaking out the, the clip from the backhand in the outlet. When you were talking about the awareness, I think that knowing what tools you have available, what techniques you have available is part of the awareness. I, I play with center defender and I didn't know how to make a proper backhand. So in that situation, that was not a tool I could use. So I had to look for a different set of solutions. And of course, the more, the more techniques you have, that is, you, you can have a better decision after because maybe there was a perfect pass that I was missing because I couldn't do it. Not because I didn't see it, I saw it, but okay, I don't have that tool to do it. And I think that's really important to develop as many options as possible in any player. And for me, this is possibly one of the biggest things that I would encourage you guys to do. Um, because just, just like um, I've said before, I love all the stuff that Jack's doing. Um, I fully buy into all of it. Um, I think he's incredible. And I'm not saying that just because he's on the call. I've said this to everyone that I've spoken to. So if you can get follow more of Jack, please do. That's, you can pay me for that later, Jack. Um, and everyone else, um, Andreu uh, Enric has been doing lots of small-sided game stuff. I, I love him and I follow every workshop that he does that's in English because I don't speak Spanish. Um, I genuinely buy into everything they're talking about. But my big challenge is um, I don't care which um, affordances you put in place and which conditions you put in the game. Just like Javier said, I can see the need to play this pass from A to B, but because I don't have the technical skill, I don't care what condition is in the game, I'm not going to play it because I know I can't do it. So this is why I genuinely believe we need to make sure we have that isolation phase where we teach the players the movement and the techniques and the manipulation and the principles, which means we give them the confidence that when they go into these small-sided games, they can start integrating it and they can try it. And that trying it in the integration phase could be part of them exploring. So because they're exploring, we don't expect the success to be very high. We, once, they've, once they've got that a little bit more, we can start to say, okay, awesome. So you made a mistake there. It's okay. Did you see the pass? Yes. Okay. We know they was aware. Did you hit the ball flat and hard? Yes. Okay. So it didn't work but you saw it and you hit the ball flat and hard, what's the missing link? Uh, I didn't have the ball in the right position, which meant that the accuracy wasn't so good. Ah, it was the preparation phase. Ah, that makes more sense. So we get, we get the ability to isolate, then put it into some training, have the conversation about exactly where these skills are going wrong. Um, and that could be anywhere from unopposed all the way up to the macro game. And then we start saying, okay, now it's the time to deliver. We're in performance phase. It's about knowing everything we've been through. Can you make the right decision at the right time based on what you know you have in your game? So for me, that's a complete overview of the way that I see the game uh, developing and the way that I think that we can take players through their own development. 
Um, I also think, Darren, that um, uh, um, you know, if you're a coach with a with a bunch of players with multiple skill sets, it's so much more valuable to you because I know just from from my experience when I know the opposition quite well, and I know a player or two players have only a limited amount of skill sets, I will exploit that uh, to my benefit. And so, for example, if I know someone always um, open face slaps, then then we close that passing line first. Um, and and so from from a coaching perspective, it's it's a whole lot easier to play against a team with limited skill sets and to ensure that you have more. I couldn't agree more, Andy. That that for me is is exactly why I want players to be able to do as much as they can. Um, so for me, that's crucial. And just to talk on that very quickly, um, there's a big piece around diversity. So that's what Andy's essentially talking about: diversity in your game. So if we imagine that this is, uh, this is one box and this is another box, if you imagine this is the problem, the box is the problem, the circle is a player and their abilities that will help us solve that problem. If we only have players that are all exactly alike, all that happens is we have a lot of players that can help solve the exact same part of a problem. But there's still all of this stuff where we don't have a solution for. Does that make sense as a concept? Uh, right, yes, if you, if you get where I'm going right now. If you don't understand, put no, and I can explain a little bit deeper. Okay, perfect. So all of this, we don't have a problem for. What we're really looking for is diversity, where we understand the players have different capabilities, different strengths, all equal in terms of the quality that they can bring, but what they bring is different, which means there's so much more of that problem we're able to really tackle. Of course, there are still parts where we don't have a solution for, and this, okay, cool, you can't plan for everything, it's, a, it's an invasion game, um, the opposition will be better at you than you at some things. There will be things that you don't quite have the skill set to de deliver and solve the problem within your game. That's fine. But at least through this kind of uh, model, you've got more chance of solving the, uh, the problem that you're going to face. Our task as coaches is to start thinking, what problem will our players actually face? So that's what I was speaking about earlier in terms of opportunity and threat. What are the opportunities that if we get better at this, we can actually hurt the opposition? So this could be my center back having the ability to hit a backhand. This could be my right forward having the ability to uh, carry and pass or have the ability to cut inside and hit a backhand pass. Um, all of those things mean that as a team, we have the skill set to be better. But also if you take that same thing and you put in all of the technical skills, so uh, push, slap, overhead, um, whatever it might be, um, uh, forehand bunt, um, whatever, that, whatever those technical skills might be, the more technical skills you have available, the, more, the easier it is for you to be able to find a solution to whatever problem that you face. Make sense? Perfect. Um, so there was a question just earlier from Faz around um, where does fitness come in? So I'm just going to go back to a previous, uh, I'm going to, again, this is uh, a different presentation to the one I was going to do with you guys. But I will go back to here because that might answer it. When we identify skills to develop, the first thing we look at is culture, which is basically, um, if you look at the British, like I said, they are very much around security, certainty, um, hard work, um, don't carry the ball, just pass it to a friend. Um, so that culture is there and it, it dictates the way the players naturally um, react to any situation. If we take the Argentinians um, as an example, they're a little bit more creative, they're a little bit more fluid in what they do, which means their game is a lot more running game. So if, I'm, if I have the ball, and you guys are making a lead for me, you're unlikely to make a lead so that I can play you a safe pass. You're probably going to make a lead that will take your defender with me 
and allow me the space to carry. So just that understanding of basic culture means that we can then get to the next side, which is the tactics that, um, will, that we can play in our game. So the tactics should always be based on the culture, not just of the country, but of the team that you are, you are coaching in that moment. Then we get to principles, which are the things that allow us to, to um, play our game successfully. And then we get to techniques. So um, at, what I see a lot is we have coaches on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, that are teaching the kids how to do all of these incredible technical skills. Then you get to a game on a Saturday and the kid tries a skill and it doesn't work and the coach starts screaming at them that they should be passing. So if the coach is expecting them to be a passing team at the weekend, why are you spending the vast majority of your time teaching them um, dribbling skills during the week? So the technical skills should be related to the kind of game that you want to play um, because I think that's how you're going to be able to develop them a little bit better. Then we get to physical. So that's your question, Faz. Where does physical training come in? I think it's the bottom of all of this. I'm not saying it's less important. What I'm saying is your physical program should be based on the technical skills that you're going to be demanding of your players, the, based on the principles that you're going to be demanding of your players. Because if I'm the coach of Korea, who are really... Um, they have really short, sharp, explosive movements, uh, and they're all about give and go and fast pace elimination, um, aggressive passing. Um, if my fitness coach is running an endurance program with them, the two don't match, and it's not actually supporting us to be the best at our game. So the physical program is something that means we are robust, and we've got the best possibility to deliver our game, um, not the other way around, I think. Uh, I'm just going into the chat. Exactly. So the physical can come into each of the physical can come into each of the the drills. But what I'm saying is, in terms of how I see it, we say, okay, this is our kind of this is our kind of style of play. Uh, therefore, these are the kind of techniques we want to do. And yes, the physical comes into it. None of these things are isolated. Um, they are all intertwined and they're all interrelated. You, of course, work on your physical within the training sessions and within the actual exercises. But it's about understanding that the way the, the, the goal of the physical program should be based on the way that we want to play hockey. And just like Stephen said, your physical limitations could restrict your tactical ability yes but um, looking at what you currently have that will give you an understanding of the culture you have what's possible in your game and therefore the style of hockey you might want to play with that team if i have a really slow team i probably don't want to play a really quick give and go get hard aggressive across the ahead of the game i probably want to play a smaller passing game than that does that make sense? And therefore, your physical program should be there to support that, as well as develop the players moving forwards. Um, da, 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 I'm just looking to see if there's anything else I've missed from the questions. Okay. Then, just really quickly, moving on. Um, do sometimes you think you have to... Da, 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 da. Yes, Javier. So... Sometimes you don't have the techniques. Um, that means you have to play different principles. What I'm talking about is um, if these are the general principles of the game, then these are the techniques we can work on so that we can um, start to play that kind of hockey. So this is uh, an aspirational piece rather than a, this is what's happening and nothing ever changes. This is an aspirational piece to allow us to get to where we want to be. Um, I also think that the mental side of the game is something that goes throughout. So we have to make sure that we're really supporting the players mentally. And then the last thing is, as I spoke about earlier, the opportunities and threats. So within all of this, we also have to look at the global picture of, okay, what is it we need to get better at so that we can hurt the opposition? And what is it that we need to get better at so the opposition don't hurt us? Um, so hopefully that is a little bit clearer. Um, any questions on any of that, guys, before we uh, move on to the last section? Mm. 
No questions? In that case, um, we will go to, so I'm just putting it up. We will go to this. So we're gonna just go away and do some tasks. Uh, so you've got some breakout rooms and you've got a chance just to uh, go and have some small conversations. Um, you've identified the following repeatable in the opposition across the whole league. And we're going to start looking at, okay, what technical training are we going to do to allow us to be able to uh, get better at this? Um, so uh, what you can see here is almost the, you can see the same situation that we saw with the backhand earlier. So the girl is on the ball. You can see the right forward over here. There's a big channel, but there's also a left back here. Maybe I can play to here and we can go up the line. We can talk about that in a bit, but this is the problem you have to solve. What I want you to do is identify a skill to develop. So what skill, why that skill, who needs to develop it, and what is it that makes it successful? Then I want you to plan for long-term development. So what might that training look like from exploration into fine tuning into performance? And then I just want a small example of a training session. So how can you bring that training to life within a training session? Um, if we look at this, we have, these are some of the possibilities. So maybe I might, might want to train the center back. So we can talk about maybe coming in with the ability to carry and eliminate through here. Maybe they play the backhand pass that we saw earlier. Maybe they do an overhead on the run into the space over here for this player. Maybe they do a disguise slap through this space or anything else. There's loads of, um, solutions to this problem. Maybe we are looking at the left back with their ability to receive, to eliminate down the line or to take across their body and to hit a backhand down the line or to play a first time deflection down the line or to catch and throw it down the line. So again, there's lots of solutions for a left back or maybe actually we're just focusing on the right forward and their ability to um, receive on the run. So for me, this is just to show you that there are so many different possibilities um, to solve that one solution, to solve that one problem. What you're gonna do now is I'm gonna give you these four, oops, we've still got some names in there. We've got these four um, problems and we're gonna put you into some groups for some breakout rooms and we're gonna tell you which one of these, um, which one of these problems we want you to solve. Actually, no, um, you guys pick a problem and you need to solve it. So you need to start thinking about the skill you want to develop within that problem, plan for long-term development, and give us an example of the training. We're going to have 30 minutes for you guys to have your breakout room, and then you'll come back and we'll just share it between you um, for 10 minutes, and then we'll just have a quick 10 minute talk as well. Um, just to give you a quick um, explanation on each of these, here you can see a box press from the blue team you can develop this player, this player, or this player, but you just need to figure out what you want to do technically. In here, there's a triangle zone. So you can develop this player, this player, or this player, knowing that they're going in this direct, uh, up the screen. Over here, you've got um, the blue team are playing crash balls into the circle. What are you going to do technically as the red player to um, maybe um, take away the threat of the opposition? And here, the blue team are defending in your back what technical skill might you want to develop in that and how might that look so 